Welcome to today's Griffles virtual meeting. Thank you for joining us. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Brian White. He's a cardiovascular perfusionist at Wellstar Kennestone Regional Medical Center in Atlanta, Georgia. He has helped develop protocols to identify patients with potential clotting disorders prior to surgery, thus reducing risks of VTE. He offers a perfusionist perspective on how hereditary antithrombin deficiency patients present in the OR and the importance of collaboration among the specialty care team. He has spoken at both the regional and national level. And Brian, when you're ready, it's time for you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here virtually. Otherwise, uh, on this lovely night, it's about 7 o'clock Eastern time here. I don't know about you guys, but it has been a lovely, rainy, cold day all day. So this is actually welcome to to <laughs> interact with people, whether it's virtual or otherwise. Um, but kind of to get more to the point here, uh, we're going to talk about hereditary antithrombin deficiency, uh, more specifically, the application and the role of AT in coagulation. Uh, this is from hereditary deficiency to diagnosis, um, surgical implications, and other applications that sometimes might be a little outside of our immediate area of focus. Um, and then we'll finish up with a few case studies to emphasize the clinical application of some of these principles. Um, so, you know, hereditary AT deficiency really isn't as rare as you might think, and we'll talk a lot about that here in the presentation. I like to harp on that point specifically. Uh, for those of us who work in open heart surgery, that statement comes as no surprise. Uh, it's, it's a fairly regular thing. We're going to see resistance in that form. Um, it's rare for me at least to go at least a full week without one or two patients with some level of resistance to heparin. Um, and based on the ACT testing that your center utilizes, you may or may not have a clear picture of the severity of this heparin resistance. Uh, and let's not glaze over the fact that hereditary AT deficiency affects anywhere from 1 to 500 and 1 in 5,000 otherwise healthy individuals. So there's a reasonable chance that someone here has a deficiency without even knowing it that's in our actual virtual group right here. Uh, and I will say, I'll tell myself really quick here, I'm a big enough nerd that I've actually looked in to some of these big lab testing centers. I think any, any lab test is near me and I've done some, you know, basic labs on myself before. And I actually asked them if they had AT3 testing. And as you can imagine, the person at the desk just looked at me with a stone face, like, what are you even talking about? But they're going to check on it for me. So that is going to be fascinating if they could actually do that as a send off lab. You know, I'm a big enough nerd that I, I think I'd enjoy uh, knowing my own level. But, um, you know, back back to the, the fact at hand here, you know, VTE patients are not exempt either in that same realm. And at a little over 16,000 patients a year, it's a significant issue that I think goes overlooked often. And we can't forget about the fact that this can affect women during pregnancy, um, you know, and in the six weeks postpartum, you know, after delivery as well, which again is outside the box, but I'll kind of wrap it back as to why it's more important um, perfusionists and nursing alike. And I like to give a little disclaimer as well. Uh, I was a nurse for almost seven years. Actually, I say the term was, you're always a nurse, once a nurse. And that's what ultimately led me into perfusion as well. So sometimes I kind of go back, go back and forth between the worlds as well, but it's only because a lack of, a, a presence of experience rather. Um, you know, this is, you know, it's what I love to talk about here, the perception sometimes of PEs and DVTs, they just happen. That's, that's a perception sometimes. They happen. Sometimes there are root causes that we figure out. Sometimes it's something we don't know. It just happens. We have treatments for PEs and DVTs, and if we follow the guidelines and then they still happen, there's nothing else that we could have done, right? I would say perhaps our perceptions of the current guidelines are missing a few things. Something critical that could be huge, maybe a piece of a puddle, puzzle, and I think, you know, all perfusionists can attest that heparin resistance is not that uncommon. It's actually something we deal with on a regular basis. So the perceptions here, I think, may be a bit askew. With that being said, we'll talk a little bit about the role of antithrombin and uh, anticoagulation. Um, this is, again, this is going to be kind of more of a review, more than anything for a perfusionist, but I do like to lay the groundwork here so we can talk a little bit about how hereditary antithrombin deficiency plays a role in this. Uh, so we know that AT plays an integral role in the clotting cascade. Uh, it inhibits actions of, of, um, of 10A and thrombin, anti 10 and thrombin, and we know that heparin relies on its interaction with this AT as a cofactor. We also know that this activity of AT is accelerated a thousand times. 
These are things that, you know, depending how long you've been a perfusionist, you know, you think about, you don't think about. It was on our boards years ago whenever you took those. But I like to repeat it. It is accelerated a thousand times when bound to heparin. So if it's accelerated a thousand times when bound to heparin, it stands to reason that the balance of sufficient AP levels and adequate heparin dosing is paramount to achieving these goals in cardiac surgery, right? I don't think anybody would question that. But let me ask you this. So how many of us have simply dosed higher and higher and higher amounts of heparin? Maybe you finally got the ACT number you were chasing. You can go on bypass and then very likely ended up having quite a bit of, of heparin given while on bypass. And I'd also be willing to bet that by the end of the case, you've seen maybe a little film or string like substances within your reservoir, maybe just a film on the edge of the reservoir uh, casing. And I say this because I've seen this in plenty of my past cases. But why are we seeing things like this with an adequate ACT number? The number is telling us we're more than adequate for bypass, whatever the case may be. So why are we seeing these issues? So in the presence of heparin resistance, that's very likely due to this predatory AT deficiency, these activated procoagulant proteins continue to circulate and that increases the risk of thrombosis. So we're seeing the components of clot building. While they may not be making a physical formed clot, we're seeing these components um, you know, alive and well within our circuit. And I can promise you, and this sends chills up and down my spine as a perfusionist, and I know it does everybody else, if you can see these components within your reservoir, they're absolutely in your oxygenator as well. So I'll take a second to let that chill wear off. So, you know, again, talking about the, the clotting cascade, um, you know, I really just bring this up to, to show, you know, as students were very well, we were very well acquainted with the slide, as perfusionists were even more so. It's kind of a, you know, that's our specialty is knowing this intimately. Um, you know, the intrinsic, extrinsic, or as we know, contact activation tissue path effect, the factor pathways make up the process for clot creation. We are familiar with these components the importance of calcium, the function of heparin, its inactivation of thrombin, uh, and factor 10A. But I want to draw your attention to the involvement of AT in virtually every step of this contact activation um, and common pathway. It's totally normal, present in everyday function um, of the clotting cascade to maintain this normal function within our bodies. It's only when outside heparin is introduced in significant amounts to reach this specific goal that we may discover that the function and volume present of AT to facilitate these desired effects, or as we so often see, the lack thereof becomes an issue. So I like this slide, it's a little more visual. Um, as I mentioned before, the massive acceleration of AT effects by heparin is the entire purpose of, of why their partnership works so effectively. Uh, but AT will continue its natural function, albeit a little less efficiently, in the absence of heparin. This is completely normal, everyday activities that are happening in your body as I speak, as we talk right here. But enter heparin into the game, and the shape of AT is altered, thereby increasing its affinity for inhibition of this factor 10A and thrombin. Um, you know, I'm a visual learner. Again, I, I like this slide. It shows that alteration of the binding um, and the physical alteration that actually occurs when this happens. So, AT deficiency can be hereditary or acquired uh, due to conditional aspects. Um, we know it, you know, sepsis, trauma, other things like that can affect it. And we all know we simply continue to dose heparin to try to reach our number that makes us feel comfortable. Then after these effects for the patient, you know, once they hit, can these after effects can be severe. Um, you know, heparin rebound, bleeding, all sorts of complications, and the potential for bring back reentries goes up as well if the bleeding is substantial enough. I mean, I think we all have had those situations where we have given the reverse dose of protamine. We know it's accurate. We know that's what we're supposed to give. Maybe we even get a, a reasonable ACT number. We leave the room. They're bleeding. And everybody kind of looks at each other when they leave the room and said, oh, what are, what's the chances this is going to come back? And we all know something else is going on. Um, and we'll get a little deeper as to where antithrombin's role can play, can play there as well, especially the identification of hereditary there. Um, we've all had those cases. So... Bringing in a little here to correlate between this AT deficiency and thrombotic risk. So I like this slide. Um, hereditary AT deficiency increases thrombotic risk 20-fold. 20 20-fold. 20 That's why I kind of like this slide. It's 
you know, the risk is greater than all other listed coagulation disorders here. And I think that's without question worth noting. Um, yet it, we really don't thoroughly address this issue with the emphasis that I believe it deserves. Um, these deficient people walk amongst us. They're just as likely to show up in the OR as any other patient. Um, and even more so if we treat these patients, and let's say they're in a mild deficiency category, we treat them, we pump them full of heparin as much as we need to get the number that we need, get them on bypass, reverse them, everything's perfectly, you know, it's great, it's wonderful. Well, you know, let's say you have a middle-aged or even young, younger-aged patient who we know the chance of them coming back for a redo in you know, 5, 10, 15 years is pretty high. We already know in surgery because we saw it that they have some sort of deficiency, likely a hereditary deficiency, that we kind of just you know, pushed off because we got the numbers we needed. So when they come back, especially with age, as you'll see in some of these slides, it can get worse. And the fact that we just pushed and kicked the can down the road could mean that this patient's going to have a lot harder time when they come for a reoperation, as opposed to having been identified ahead of time as somebody that needed this extra support. So as we can see here, um, we can see here that the low to borderline plasma levels of antithrombin are associated with a twofold risk of VTE, and that's significant enough. Um, it's another piece of the puzzle, I think, that shows how important the presence of AT deficiency can be here. And we can see here, you know, the antithrombin levels are variable, um, you know, over 100%, and then the different ranges that come with it as well, these um, plasma levels. Um, you know, even in the presence of mild deficiency, as we can see here, VTE risk is elevated. Uh, my center specifically does test AT levels preoperatively on patients, and I'll say, at least anecdotally, even in the mild deficiency patients, we still see some levels of heparin resistance. Um, you know, I think I, I've had a lot of colleagues will say, when you're just in a mild deficiency situation, you know, you, you shouldn't think of dosing from and you, you simply get what you need from heparin, continue dosing. You know, I, I've seen patients, and, you know, if you don't have a baseline AT3, you can't really work off that, but I've seen patients with baseline AT3s that fall in the, the realm of mild deficiency and, you know, think a thing about it, maybe tack on an extra five or 10,000 to their standard heparin dose and think, oh, that's going to cover it. I've seen it more often than not that you give your standard heparin dose and they are well below what you need to go on bypass. So then you enter that realm of give a little more, give a little more, guess and check. And I mean, more than anything, it's burning your time. It's burning the patient's time in the OR. Perhaps you're even cannulated already, sitting there waiting to go on bypass. And more than anything, to get the surgeon's attention, it's burning their time. Their time is sitting there being wasted. And I mean, we've all seen it can add 15, 20, 30 minutes or even more to get what the patient actually needs to go on bypass. And sometimes, you know, finally you get somebody to throw in the towel and say, well, let's just give some AT3 and don't, I won't even go into that, just to give a little, the guess and check situation. Uh, there's a better way, just suffice it to say that. Um, so, you know, as we can see here, again, I was just talking about it a couple slides ago, age plays a part in this thrombotic risk as well, more specifically for those age 15 above. Um, and then adult cardiac surgery, that's essentially our, what we're gonna see the majority of, that 15 above range. Not to say that we don't see below, uh, there's plenty that we do. Um, you know, I think it's it's more interesting to say here on the slide, by age 50. So if you're looking between that percentage of patients 70 to 85 there, we know that between that 15-year gap there is that steady climb to that 85% uh, of that cumulated thrombotic risk in that, uh, you know, with age there. And again, it goes back to the, the redo scenario that I was talking about. If you have somebody who's 30, between 35 and 40 years old that has that surgery, whether it's a cabbage or a valve or whatever it is, and they have that mild deficiency that we simply treat without just dealing with it, just get more heparin, and we end up giving heparin and reversing it and everything's fine, odds are that when they come back, whether it's 50 or 60 years old, there's going to be an increased risk and potentially increased uh, complications with that as well. Um, you know, here we see, again, increased risk of VTE in carriers of familial thrombotic defects that have no prior thrombotic events at all. And I think it's worth pointing out here that 42% is a pretty significant, um, sorry, pretty significant uh, transient risk factor, and certainly in the realm of potentially preventable, I think. Um, you know, so it's worth noting that familial, familial effect. We'll talk a little bit more about um, the genetic predisposition for that as well. 
in a couple of slides here. Actually, there we go. Knew it was coming up. Uh, so I will spare you the full genetics lesson here, but ultimately this points out that each child of a person with an autosomal dominant disorder has a 50% chance of inheriting this disease. 50%. So that's half. And I mean, I think that certainly stands to reason why we see the volume of high resistance we do in surgery um, with significant odds of passing these traits from generation to generation. And again, why there's a good chance that someone here tonight in this virtual meeting that we're having here has some level of uh, hereditary AT deficiency on board. So plasma levels of AT are an excellent way to customize what we'll need to support these patients on bypass. Uh, my center, like I said, currently draws these levels and it's a great help in our preparation and support to our patients. I always get this question, so I'll address it here. What about simply using FFP? It's less expensive, AT is present. So let's talk for just a second about the risk versus benefit. So there's volume, quality, and exposure to transfusion. First, the volume. We all know that in a unit of FFP, you're 250, 350 cc's of volume, give or take. Quality. We'll get to that in just a second. We know that there's an exposure to transfusion, so let's say this patient has not necessarily needed any other transfusions, any other blood products for that matter. So now we're saying that we're going to give them plasma simply on the basis that it contains this, this antithrombin value. Fair enough. The quality is what gets to me, though, and I think this is what people sometimes don't think about. In a unit, let's say one unit of AT per one milliliters of reference plasma here. Let's say that's true. Is it always true, though? Think about that. Plasma donations are taken all over the country. It's wonderful. It's a great thing to do. It can help out hugely. It's great to donate blood and blood components. But again, let's think about that familial trans transition of genetics here, that 50% hereditary AT deficiency. That means there's a pretty good chance that somebody's walking around trying to be a good citizen, trying to donate plasma with hereditary AT deficiency on board. So they donated a unit of plasma that's deficient. We don't know the exact percentage of deficiency. It's not something that's tested in plasma. So that well-meaning situation in which they gave um, a number of clotting factors in that unit of plasma, just not so much high quality AT is now being given to this patient on the principle that they suspect there's a unit of AT in every mill of plasma. However, maybe it's closer to like a half a unit of antithrombin or even maybe even less, depending on the severity of deficiency. So now you've exposed to transfusion, you've given the volume where maybe you don't even need the volume, and you may be possibly not even getting the quality of product you think you are. So there are classifications. I won't get into specific details here. That's not something that's you know, really gonna be in our realm of, uh, of diagnoses and, and what we do. Really more important, you know, it's separated here by quantitative and qualitative components. Essentially, we're just, uh, we just, you know, we need to know this actual level of circulating antithrombin uh, and what's its actual functionality. That's much more important to us. And I think more, as far as we're concerned as clinicians, uh, more important information to know and how we can treat. So, you know, diagnosis is a little more difficult. Again, this is going to be done by a hematologist. Um, but it can provide a, a clear picture for actual treatment and guide of future care. Uh, we do not currently classify deficiencies at my center, uh, but it's something that I've worked towards and certainly advocating for in terms of the hematology consult for these patients. Um, we actually, it's a victory I celebrate, we just recently got about a month ago to go ahead to add a filter to all of our cardiac traumas, being aortic dissections, STEMIs, things like that, so that when they come through the ER, their initial lab panel also includes an AT level so that, fingers crossed, hopefully by the time they get up to this, us in the OR, as long as they're not actively dissecting or needing to go on bypass quickly, within an hour or so, we usually have that AT level back with most of the rest of the labs. So we at least know what we're dealing with in an emergent situation to know that if we need to run our protocols, figure out what we need to do. But that's something, you know, I think is a great thing to advocate at your center. And if you're starting from scratch, start with the advocacy of simply you know, getting AT3 testing. Um, you know, obviously, a thorough h and is one of the most important things um, in discovering past indicators that may lead us to consider the presence of AT deficiency. Uh, really, if you see that history of VTE, that's the light bulb moment, I always say. 
um, your first sh uh, thought should be that they are at this elevated risk or AT deficiency. I tell all the students that come through my center, when you're reading the HMP, if you see DBT, PE, any kind of uh, coagula coagulopathy for that matter, always think, does this have something to do with, you know, obviously family history as well with spontaneous VTE? Could this have something to do with hereditary AT3? You know, we need to think about how, what their actual response to heparin and for that matter, um, actual oral anticoagulants could be as well, because clearly they've got some sort of pro-thrombotic situation going on if they've got this sort of history. So that, obviously, there can be a number of reasons for AT deficiency uh, outside of the hereditary AT. We won't talk about a whole lot of it. Um, more tuned in this presentation is towards the hereditary AT deficiency, but it's important that the patient's worked up properly and to evaluate the, the cause more than anything. Obviously, we know consumption of, of antithrombin can be through a number of things like extracorporeal devices, DIC, hemolytic, uh, hemolytic uremic syndromes. Um, you know, you can also have some situations that give you decreased AT synthesis as well um, and also in increased AT excretion as well. Uh, and, and don't forget, especially with these ECMO patients that are on these temporary forms of continuous dialysis, those are things that can affect um, not just antithrombin levels, but a number of things as well. So, you know, also keep in mind, there are clinical considerations that affect how we view AT levels, deficiencies, the types of deficiencies as well. And more than anything, the takeaway is how they may affect the treatment more than anything that we provide to these patients. Uh, that's the most important thing. And where we can make the biggest impact as clinicians, um, you know, in the operating room and for that matter, beyond as well. So, you know, providing a rationale for AT replacement therapy here, I think, you know, there are clear rationales in heparin resistance when you suspect this uh, hereditary deficiency. Uh, and obviously in, in surgery, uh, in our realm in cardiac surgery, but even more so uh, orthopedic, oncologic, general, neuro. I mean, there's a, a number of reasons that some of these thrombotic complications occur uh, and they can be in the presence of this AT deficiency. We as perfusionists, obviously these are things that we're a little more intimately acquainted with, but as you can imagine in other areas of surgery that clearly don't provide, you know, we don't provide service there. It can be a little more complicated to provide this sort of service to patients. Um, you know, what's more interesting than anything else, and I'll kind of relate it back to how it affects us here, uh, in pregnancy, VT risks seven to tenfold during pregnancy. I mean, and even peaks after delivery. And I can tell you, you know, some stories for myself. I've had a, a couple instances of uh, uh, pregnancy and bypass in my career so far. One was a, a dissection that we actually had to deliver in the operating room prior to performing a dissection on the mother. Luckily, both baby and mom lived, and they're doing fine. And then another was a, a cabbage that we had to perform on a pregnant woman. She was about seven months pregnant at that time, so it was extremely tricky, uh, both in the presence of heparin resistance. Now, at that time, we weren't testing AT3 levels, so there are a lot of questions and things that didn't necessarily match up that we didn't know because we didn't have baselines. So I can't tell you for sure what we did, why we did that sort of thing. But I can tell you that um, there certainly was – a pro-thrombotic state to pregnancy, excuse me. And I don't think that's any, any, any shock. You know, a lot of the data supports that as well. Uh, and we'll see some of the slides as well that I'll talk about, you know, some of the experiences I had with that in just a, a little bit. But, um, you know, in the presence of this hereditary AT deficiency, there's no question that there's an increase. And I think it reiterates there um, at the, uh, the, the third portion on the right side there, again, hereditary deficiency by age 50, 85%. Um, BT, you know, 85% of patients with this deficiency by age 50. That's a huge number of these patients that are deficient that are going to have this VTE occurrence, um, you know, and these recurrent thrombosis also in this hereditary deficiency. So it's something I think that doesn't get the attention that it, it needs. So a little profile in here. We have Stephen, 48 years of age. History includes a recurrent DVT. So obviously light bulb goes off there. There's some sort of procoagulopathy going on here, so let's read further. Recently, he was diagnosed with a DVT in his left leg. Uh, and now has symptoms of recurrent in his right leg. His family history shows no signs of thrombophilia, but there have been some unexplained premature death on his mother's side. So we can kind of draw some conclusions to that as well. Take home here is 70% of patients with this hereditary deficiency will have thrombotic events by the age of 35. 70%. 
That's a pretty stout number. So we talk about Stephen's daughter here, 25 years of age, and this kind of wraps it back into pregnancy uh, relation here. Her medical history includes a PE already, which occurred during pregnancy. She already has one child, considering having another, so it obviously would be a high-risk pregnancy here. Family history, as we just talked about with Stephen's show's father, has that experienced recurrent DVT. Up to 70% of pregnant women with hereditary AT deficiency may experience these thrombotic complications. 70% is huge, especially for these patients. Uh, and unfortunately, as we well know, a lot of these patients go undiagnosed until, boom, something happens like a PE that she had in her, her first pregnancy. And it doesn't specifically say it here, but you know, with a PE in her first pregnancy, you would hope that some level of diagnosis has been reached at this point to figure out why she had that PE in her first pregnancy. And perhaps they did find out that she had some sort of hereditary deficiency so that in the second pregnancy, they can better treat her. So the perception, we've all heard this before, AT deficiency is rare. There's really no need to test. It's just, you know, going down the rabbit hole is something that isn't, isn't necessary. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's not as rare as most clinicians believe. Perfusionists can attest to that. It's prevalent. You know, I've, I've said the numbers before. This one in 500 to one in 5,000, it's a, it's a big range, but it's present. We see it frequently. We see it anywhere from mild to severe deficiencies in it. Um, unfortunately, I suspect, and just from anecdotal evidence, talking to a lot of my colleagues uh, you know, across the country that I've gotten to speak to, most of the time the reaction is give more heparin because that's sometimes what, what works out in your favor for these mild deficiencies. And unfortunately, in the severe deficiencies, these patients end up getting a pretty substantial dose of heparin before someone throws in the towel and says, let's just give a vial, maybe two vials. And unfortunately, it may or may not help at that situation. It may or may not just simply get you on bypass in which you may give more heparin and more heparin as opposed to actually having some sort of concerted protocol to run beforehand to prevent the tremendous amount of heparin that this patient is going to get in addition to potentially then receiving a product. So again, perception, AT levels don't really matter to clinical management. No real reason to run them. I can tell you this one specifically came out of my chief CT surgeon's mouth for many, many years until I finally convinced him based on, you know, again, you know, I say this I, based on data. I say this to a lot of the students that come through. I've, say this, I've said this to uh, some of the perfusion schools that I presented this to as well. Data is your sword. If you need a weapon, data is your sword. And if you're trying to advocate for something like I've tried to advocate and finally got the creation of, um, you know, the protocol that we use in surgery for uh, hereditary AT deficiency, you simply sometimes have to share the data. We're all clinicians. We all want to do best practice. We all want to create the best possible treatment for a patient. So if you can show that there is data that provides emphasis to your point that you're trying to make, eventually, you, you know, you can't turn a blind eye to it. So this risk for VT is high if hereditary AT deficiency is not identified. That's part of the data that I even used on some of the patients that, uh, that I you know, showed to my chief CT surgeon, as well as bleeding, as well as complications and other things like that. But whatever you need to make the point and the purpose that you're trying to, to do is, you know, pull the data. That's what I always say. Um, you know, it's no shocker there. Low AT levels are going to cause a poor response to heparin. That's a correlation that we see time and time again. But if you don't have the level, it's hard to, to know what's really causing it. So I like this. Is it really getting the attention it deserves? VT risk and obstetric? I suspect not. Um, it, I, you know, it's interesting, and, and somebody made this point. I don't know that obstetric physicians, OBs, you know, you wouldn't think they have a whole lot of experience in treating things in terms of, you know, the use of anticoagulants. And they likely don't. It's not something that's common in their purview. So enter a patient that's either undiagnosed or even diagnosed with a hereditary AT deficiency. I almost guarantee you some of the best clinicians or best OBs are going to be the ones that immediately turn around and reach out and say, I need help, either from hematology or, you know, whatever other consult they decide is going to help them out here because it's not necessarily in their direct purview of what they usually treat. So that would be the smart move. You know, I think it's the question we pose here, again, is are we adequately evaluating these VT risks for these patients? Um, the risks extend from pregnancy through the postpartum period. We've said that before. 
Um, we know the healthcare professionals don't really have the experience that they probably need. Um, and the training may not even be there. So I think the referrals are, are extremely important in these situations. Um, you know, I think the, the take home here, we've, we've seen the Virch Health Triad. Uh, I can tell you in, in pregnancy, uh, they've got all of this. We, we, we know, you know, a pregnant woman has all three of these uh, situations going on and then add in a C-section and even more so. Um, but the take home here is this four to tenfold increased risk for women during pregnancy and, and peripartum of VTE. It's, that's huge. And then add in that hereditary AT deficiency diagnosis and you're through the roof. And is it any wonder in that case study that we looked at a few slides ago that she had a PE in her first pregnancy as well, likely undiagnosed at that point, and hopefully she's received that diagnosis so that they can treat her adequately for the second potential uh, uh, pregnancy. So we know that there are a number of changes in a woman's body during pregnancy, but it's important to know how these changes can participate in increasing the risk for VTE in many scenarios. Um, you know, the increase in clotting factors, decrease in certain clotting factors as well. Um, you know, it's that pro-coagulant state that women are in as well. Um, you know, the reduction of venous flow and the increase of circulating volume as well that does happen. Uh, it's all that perfect scenario for uh, prothrombo prothrombosis in the form of PE, DVT, or mixture of different things as well. This is kind of um, going back to the story I was telling earlier and having the experience with um, uh, the pregnant woman who was actually in need of a cabbage who we actually had to do on bypass. This was interesting. Did not have an AT3 level for her when we did it, but she, um, uh, this is actually, sorry, this is the, uh, the other woman I hadn't even talked about. Sorry, my third, my other experience. Uh, I had to do a cabbage on a, uh, a postpartum mother of about 12 hours. She was actively having an MI after giving regular childbirth so we took her downstairs. She did well as, uh, also um, a little more straightforward because she had already given birth. But it was interesting because she was very severely resistant to heparin. And again, we didn't have an AT3 level, but I certainly didn't see it coming. Um, she seemed to be pretty straightforward. She did. She was fairly young, I think in her mid-30s. So it was surprising to us. She was fairly healthy, but had an extensive family history of cardiovascular um, disease, multiple family members who had had cabbages as well. So it's I guess it wasn't super shock, but she had a, a pretty severe heparin resistance. And there's a, you know, you have to wonder, obviously, without having pre-op testing and analysis as well, did she have a form of hereditary AT deficiency within her family as well, possibly causing thrombosis, possibly providing some of that cardiovascular disease, adding to it? It's extremely possible. But I can tell you that I did have a pretty severe heparin resistance that we did have to utilize um, treatment for her to, to overcome that that resistance. Uh, again, data is your weapon. It's your sword. So if you've got these AT3 levels, if you have this care preoperatively, especially postoperatively as well, then these patients are going to have a much better outcome. We can see here, you know, again, even at 12 weeks postpartum, there's an increased risk for VTE over the nonpartum reference. Um, you know, it, it, it ties it back into what we do. And I can tell you, if you're in perfusion long enough, you will have either through ECMO or through bypass or both experience with women who are either actively pregnant or in, in the active or immediate postpartum period. Uh, so it stands a reason to know what sort of phase that they're in and what sort of risks uh, come with that. So, you know, I think I've, I've stumped the point a lot, this VT risk in, in, in pregnant women. Um, but again, up to 70% of these pregnant women with these hereditary AT uh, deficiency who don't receive a prophylactic therapy may experience uh, VTE. And I think that's more important there, that line, who do not receive this prophylactic therapy. And again, that's up to OBs. It's up to that early identification. Uh, you know, if, if these women are already coming in with a hereditary AT deficiency diagnosis, then that's great. Then they can be channeled through the proper authorities to be treated, to be evaluated. But I mean, if this is something that we're relying on, you know, OBs, we're relying on nursing to catch, we're relying on, you know, general physicians or intensivists, it's going to be a difficult thing to catch. Uh, and that's where, unfortunately, in an emergency, they make it back to us as perfusionists. And we see it in an initial ACT test after giving, you know, a large dose of heparin to go on bypass. And that may be the first time anybody's seen a true resistance 
to show that maybe there's something else going on. So it's very difficult, but it, it does make it even more important for us to ring that bell and say, you know, after the smoke settles and hopefully we've had a good outcome with them, could we follow up? at least to make our case known to the surgeons, cardiac PAs, whoever may be continuing their care uh, postoperatively. You know, I mean, I think we've all seen these cases of pulmonary embolism as well. We know it accounts for 10% of all deaths in hospitalized patients. It's one of the most preventable causes of in-hospital mortality. If you're, again, I say this, if you're perfusionist long enough, you'll get that call for a PE possible active arrest that you need to you know, slam onto ECMO so we can simply stabilize them to figure out what's going on, whether we need surgical or, or uh, you know, pharmaceutical um, amelioration of that. But if you haven't, if you're a new enough perfusionist and you haven't had that experience yet, you will. I promise you will. But again, all these PEs, first thought in your head is what's really going on? Why do they have a PE? Uh, likely, these patients come with some sort of coagulopathy history. Maybe they're on one or more oral anticoagulants already. And then the question has to be added, asked, I think. And, and often, it's, a, it's fascinating how often these PE patients, when they come in, even with visits uh, to their, maybe their vascular surgeon, their, their you know, physician as well, they've never been evaluated for hereditary AT deficiency. Uh, and I've, I've successfully gotten a couple hematologists uh, consult on these PE patients while they're on ECMO, and then they follow up with them, you know, after the course of ECMO as well, hopefully if they come off ECMO, and then uh, potentially follow up for diagnoses. So we can see here that VTE risk during surgery in the general population varies among the specific surgical population, but it's not without significant risk among all the populations that are listed here. Um, but, you know, I think emphasis is given to the orthopedic, uh, I can't speak, orthopedic surgical population, especially in joint replacement surgery. Um, you know, we know very specifically in joint replacement surgery, it's, an, it's a substantial surgery. But now, you know, in the postoperative period, especially in modern times, it's, a, it's just about almost to the point of having outpatient surgery. I mean, you're up and moving sometimes within hours, depending on which joint has been replaced. Uh, in physical therapy and out of the hospital as quickly as they can get you there. Um, it is fascinating, though, the for these patients because of their mobility challenges that come, you know, in the weeks, in the, the days and the weeks after surgery, they're usually on some form of anticoagulant, be it just some sort of maybe low Vinox or low molecular weight heparin. Um, but again, if they don't have a response, a good response to heparin, even the low molecular weights have... Uh, you know, uh, they have a reliance upon uh, proper AT levels. So you could have some issue with this. That therein lies your DVT risk. And a lot of these patients do receive, especially if they have minor complications that keep them in the hospital a little bit longer. Um, all of a sudden, hey, my, my calf hurts. And they'll, they figure out they have a DVT because they haven't been able to get out of bed and do a lot of these exercises. So it stands to reason, especially in a cardiac surgical population whose patients typically aren't moving around real fast in the, at least that first 24 or 36 hour period that they would be at an increased risk as well. So, yeah, I think that kind of leads into what I was just saying a second ago and the post-surgical patients with these AT deficiencies, um, you know, the, the risk is super high. And I like to say here, um, you know, this is, I think, something people forget about sometimes. If you have a patient that's been identified as resistant and you do actively treat as you need to reverse your patient afterwards, ACT is baseline normal again, send them out to the unit, there's a problem there. And the problem is that you've already identified, you, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, they were resistant. You identified a course of treatment. You treated them. But then you reversed everything sent them back to their baseline level, which is a pro-coagulant you know, pro level, and then sent them back out to the ICU where they're going to sit in bed until they get extubated, which ideally six hours or less, but you know, we'll see if it's a perfect world. Then they're going to be in bed at least 12 hours or so. The goal of 12 hours, at least nationally, is to try to sit them up, if not get them out of bed to a chair, and then hopefully within 24 hours up to the floor. We all know we don't live in a perfect world. So enter a patient like that, that you reverse to this pro-thrombotic state. You sent them out to the ICU. They're not going to be on anything 
initially in terms of anticoagulation, if they're on much at all, maybe some Plavix or something eventually starting, but they're pretty immobile. And if they aren't following the normal path of mobility, um, which often happens, and they maybe get an extra day or two stay in the ICU because of one reason or another, then that risk of VTE keeps ticking up, up, up with time. So it kind of stands to reason at that point to ring the bell even more so of, hey, we had to treat this patient interoperatively. Can we follow up postoperatively? What sort of plan do we want to make? Do they need a hematology consult? Um, do we need to continue maybe some form of anticoagulation afterwards or possibly even another dose in the postoperative period of antithrombin because they have a resistance? And that's actually uh, an, a, a realistic technique that's used specifically for people that do have diagnosed hereditary AT deficiency. I will take any questions you guys may have, and thank you for listening to the, the whole spiel I have here. You can ask questions from anything throughout the presentation, if, you, if anything's been on your mind, or anything not even having to do with the presentation. All right. Thank you, Brian. And now on to our question and answer session. As a reminder, Q&A is located on the right-hand side of your screen. To submit a question, type your question in the small text box at the bottom. When finished, click the Send button. If you'd like to ask your question verbally, please use the raise hand icon on the top of the toolbar to indicate that you'd like to speak. I will instruct you to unmute when it's your turn. Please ensure your microphone is connected at the top of the toolbar. The icon will turn green when connected. Remember to self-mute when not speaking and try to keep the background noise to a minimum when unmuted. I think I see somebody typing here. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I really enjoy giving this presentation. It's nothing more than to spread the word on how important this stuff can be and really kind of open eyes. You know, we sometimes we don't think about it uh, in our day to day and we see mild resistance and then we go a while in between seeing our severe resistant patients and having to use uh, treatments for them specifically. But I mean, I think it's, it, Trust me, it makes your life a lot easier when you have these tools like an AT3 level, um, you know, a protocol to run that actually helps you treat some of these hereditary, these obvious hereditary deficiencies these patients come with, um, you know, and it, it makes the surgeons way happier when you can convince them that your time is very important. We respect this, ma'am or sir. So in effort of that, how about instead of going back and forth and having, you know, let's give more, let's check, let's give more, let's check. Let's just wipe all that out and make sure that we treat whatever needs to be treated ahead of time so that none of this happens. And I can tell you, it's been about a year now, a little over a year, year and a half now, since we've started to do uh, AT3 levels on all patients. Um, and it has been, it's been wonderful simply knowing and being able to correlate. We do use the HEPCON. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, we do use the HEPCON as well um, and to get actual uh, heparin levels. Uh, on these patients, and it, it, it helps a lot to see these dose responses versus the AT3 levels as well, and kind of how they correlate to be able to to run our protocols to treat as needed before we give these heparin doses so that we can go and bypass. And I can tell you, it's, it's a rare day now that we don't simply, whether we're treating or otherwise, give our standard heparin bolus to go and bypass, get the number we need, go right on. And that's worth its weight in gold to not have to deal with all those headaches and frustrations. So I really appreciate everybody's time. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to type them. Um, but I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to my presentation tonight.